All right, we'll take it from the top again. <laughs> Welcome to the Commemorative Air Force Warbird Tube webinar. I'm your host, Steve Buss, and we're glad you can join us tonight. This webinar series is made possible by the Commemorative Air Force, and you can support the CAF through membership or donations. Now, for details on how you can further our mission to educate, inspire, and honor, please visit our website at commemorativeairforce.org. And joining me from the CAF Central Texas Wing are John Sirie and Ray Clausen. Tonight, we continue our series on the featured 12 planes of Christmas. Tonight, it's the Bell P-39 Aracobra. Gentlemen, good evening and welcome to the webinar. Thanks, Steve. Thank you for having us. Well, let's uh, let's talk just briefly about uh, your backgrounds a little bit. John, we'll start with you. How did you get involved in aviation and in the CAF? No, I uh, grew up in uh, the Dallas-Fort Worth area in Hearst and uh, three older brothers. My oldest brother, Mark, uh, got his pilot's license when he was... Uh, 16 and so at a young age i remember uh fondly riding in the very front of his uh riding the front seat of his uh, j3 cub going to uh, a caf show i believe it was in denton and uh, uh literally we were landing and one of the tora tora planes flew by us and uh, ever since then i've always wanted to fly warbirds and be a part of the caf and and so here we are so i, I owe it to my uh, older brother mark how long have you been uh, active with the Commemorative Air Force? You know, off and on uh, since I got my uh, license. Uh, I moved here. I'm in Lockhart, uh, just uh, nearby the uh, San Marcos Airport. And so uh, when I moved here, I knew that we had that great, great unit, the Syntex Wing. And so been going off and on uh, over there since uh, since then and actually got my uh, pilot's license about that same time, about 2001. So uh, since then, uh, been, been involved and I own my own uh, steerman, uh, which is uh, behind me here in the hangar. And and so uh, I guess you could say uh, either either since I've been 10 years old when the, the Torah plane flew by or uh, since uh, since about 2000. Sounds good. Uh, Ray, how about your background? Well, I got hooked on uh, aviation watching crop dusters when I was about five years old out in South Texas. Uh, but moving to San Antonio in uh, 2005, needed a little something extra to do to kill some spare time and walked into the Central Texas Wing hangar and I've been hooked ever since. I went and got my license uh, a couple of years later to work on aircraft and uh, I have been the maintenance officer ever since. Sounds good. Well, tonight we're going to talk about an airplane. As I said, we're, we're featuring in the 12 planes of Christmas, the P-39 looking at the airplane right now, but uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the unique aspects of the, the P-39 itself, um, actually starting with the engine placement. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, this is late 1930s technology. So you got to kind of put it in perspective uh, when, uh, when Bell Aircraft in Buffalo, New York uh, was designing this, this airplane. It was actually in the late, you know, 30s, like 1937, I believe is when they were first design in this. And so, you know, to see the engine and when it first came out to have the engine in the behind the pilot instead of, you know, the traditional in front, uh, that was a, probably the biggest, biggest eye opener uh, of this design. And so here you see in this picture, we've got the uh, cowling off, which is, I guess it'd be the cowling or the deck, the turtle deck behind, right? Is that? Is that we call it cowling, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. But, uh, and we do call the turtle deck to that section behind the pilot, yes. Yeah, so it's, you know, which is different. You know, typically the cowling is in the front. Uh, so here this is, and this is a great picture because you can see the uh, the cockpit there. The, the seat literally is just right up to the back of that Allison engine. The pilot actually is in, in the engine compartment. Uh, that engine is bolted directly to the frame. There's no shock absorbing, no nothing. So he's, once he closes the doors and the windows, he's in with the heat, the vibration, the noise, everything. So austere ride. And also unique is that there's a, uh, a drive shaft that actually runs under the pilot seat uh, to, to uh, make the propeller run uh, up front. So that's uh, kind of an innovative uh, design for its, for its time by the, uh, the folks at Bell. Yeah, I mean, obviously the, uh, the, the, you know, the whole plane really was built around the cannon, the 37 millimeter cannon uh, to allow it to fire 
directly center line through the nose and to be able to carry their weight. So um, by doing that, it's it's kind of like a modern what A10, you know, the warthog by uh, by building the building the airplane around the the armament. So the uh, the with the uh, uh, that being in the front, it allowed the uh, drive shaft to go literally. It goes right. I'd say it goes about ankle. I don't know what do you think, right? About your about your ankles. It goes uh, right. Yes. Yeah, so right underneath your seat, right right underneath your ankles. And interesting too, another another neat feature about it, you know, when you start looking at the engineering to make this all happen, uh, the the uh, the stick or the yoke, or I'm gonna call it the stick, actually has a it's a ring because once it gets down to the base, because the drive shaft has to go through the control of the of the uh, stick. So you know, you start thinking about, okay, we're going to put the engine in the back and have the dry shaft go up to the front, go to another gearbox to the engine, allow the uh, 37 millimeter cannon to fire through the center of the hub. You know, I mean, a lot going on there. Again, let's bring it back to late 1930s. Yeah, we've got a, a picture here. Let's skip forward where you can actually, you can, we're actually looking into the cockpit now. Um, and uh, you can kind of see what uh, what they're they're talking about. It's, it's a little hard to to see right underneath uh, with this with the seat in the way there, but um, this is what you're talking uh, about the uh, unique aspect of of the uh, control stick. That's, that's it. The shaft going through there. Yes, you're absolutely right, Steve. Yeah, so it's just a donut basically uh, connected there, so that way the drive shaft can go right right through there. And one of the other. Uh, Great things with the airplane is the uh, the doors. I mean, it's it's like an automobile <laughs> doors. Uh, can you roll the windows down on that too? Yes, yeah. you can. Just like a car. Yeah, it's it's like the old automobile. I mean, it's the it's literally it's got a, a a knob or on both sides. There's doors on both sides that open up, just like a regular car, just like in the 30s, and a plate glass window on both sides that you can roll down. Uh, uh, to uh, to allow air in. So, and we're looking uh, here. Uh, uh, Craig Hutain, uh, one of the the uh, current pilots who uh, qualified in the uh, in the P thirty nine. Yeah, Craig. Craig's working there with you, right? Yes. Uh, I, as soon as the plane comes in from any kind of flight, I typically run out to it just to debrief the pilots and get their impressions. I want to know if there's any little vibrations, noises, anything, and I just pick their brains for as long as they can sit there in the cockpit. Well, that's good, and that's that's one of the keys to keeping these uh, older airplanes flying is to uh, yeah, I really have to pay attention to any uh, kind of squeaks or groans or or rumbles that you hear before they become uh, big problems, I and mean, you can take care of them when they're still little problems. I like acorns rather than oak trees. Yes, uh, there you go. You were talking about the, the characteristics of the plane a moment ago, and if you look at the state of aviation technology in the mid to late 30s when this was designed, this was almost a Star Wars leap from what there had been there. This had this huge Allison V-12 engine in it, uh, water-cooled, uh, the cannon in the nose, uh, the doors, car doors with rolling down windows, and it was the first tricycle landing gear uh, yeah, good points, and, and and quite frankly, that was kind of the uh, I think you know some of the issues that the the American pilots or the pilots in general when they started flying this, they started questioning it. You know, there was questions about, hey, is the engine going to crush me if we you know if we hit something? Is the is the drive shaft going to come out like my car, you know, and and beat the heck out of the airplane, or is uh, you know, um, you know, on and on and on, and then and then even the nose wheel. You know, today pilots we go, oh, it's a nose wheel, but back then they didn't see such a thing, especially on a fighter. It just didn't look like a fighter with this long nose wheel gear, you know, in the in the front of it. So I think initially, with all the the uh, innovations that are brought to it, I think that's what started causing you know the initial. You know the ideas of of uh, you know this this plane not being up to par, so to speak, uh, at at the beginning. Well, and we've got a, uh, a picture here that kind of shows the uh, the location of the the cannon and the the uh, a very large diameter uh, 
a hole in the in the prop hub there to uh, accommodate the the cannon. Yeah, that's that's a neat picture, and it's 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 one that I always always want to show people when we have the spinner off, you know, because then you then you really just see the how large that. And I think he had just showed a picture of the uh, the actual thirty seven millimeter round that goes through that hole. Yeah, there you go. So many of y'all are probably familiar with the fifty cows, which are to the right as you're facing this. Uh, those are the uh, there's the fifty cows. Yep, with some of the tracers in it. But look at look at the size, look at the size of a 37 millimeter round, a cannon round. Lots of firepower. And uh, lots of speed to go uh, along with that firepower. Yeah, that was one of the uh, early requirements that they went to Bell uh, that the airplane was supposed to produce. Um, it was supposed to be a 400 mile an hour fighter. Um, the, the, you know, as probably many of y'all know or have read about on the P-39, um, you know, it's, it, it was originally, they were looking at putting a, uh, a turbocharger on it to allow it to go higher altitudes and speeds. And, and when they were doing that, of course, that, it, that requires the air scoop, you know, putting the big scoops on the side and aerodynamically, they couldn't, they couldn't get the speeds out of it and it was starting to become a hindrance and, and time was ticking, so to speak, on the contract for the uh, the P-39. And so some some think that maybe uh, Bell decided to go ahead and just uh, remove it and just put a, uh, um, uh, not a turbocharger, but a, uh, a supercharger on it, um, in, you know, just to get it in production, but also too, they think that maybe at that time they were thinking they needed a low altitude fighter. Uh, they thought that that was going to be sufficient for what they were doing. Because again, it was the Army. It was the Army, you know, Air Forces that were looking at thinking it was going to be more for the ground or low level stuff. And so that 400, uh, the picture of this is just showing, showing the, uh, you know, how impressive that was again at that time, reaching those kind of speeds. And, and it did for the, for the trials, it was reaching uh, 300 and like 96 miles an hour was the was the sale uh, on it, but it did not have the turbochargers, so that meant it was a more of a low altitude or was a low altitude uh, aircraft, which then caused uh, the British and others, including the Americans, to decide, hey, that may not be the right plane for us. You know, we need a, we need some high altitude, which then then leads us into uh, the Russians and the Lend Lease program. Where this where this plane excelled and where they where they were thrilled with this aircraft. Yeah, it really was uh, for the uh, for the Russians. It was that mid low to mid level uh, fighter that uh, had some very uh, impressive uh, combat sorties and and but again as as you mentioned the uh, American and Allied uh, philosophy was more uh, high altitude, which just did not suit this aircraft at all. So. You, throughout its history, it's sort of been, um, I, I guess, maybe not seen as 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 highly uh, rated as a Mustang or a Spitfire, but yet it in in its role and used properly by well trained pilots, it had a very impressive combat record in the uh, low to mid mid altitudes. So well, so yeah, it did. And matter of fact, it's it is the highest. It has the highest number of kills of any other aircraft. I mean, it's the highest ranking kill of, uh, of American aircraft, you know, mm -hmm. in any war. So uh, the P-39 is absolutely a fantastic uh, aircraft, like you said, just in the hands of the uh, the right pilot in the right situation. The Russians yeah. proved that. Uh, also unique uh, were some of the, the control systems on the airplane. Yeah, Ray, uh, we were, we, we actually took this picture, took this picture out of an old uh, uh, film, uh, old uh, Army Air Corps film uh, training video, because we wanted to see the stenciling. And this is the emergency gear uh, release. Uh, as you can see, it says electric, uh, and then you, you switch down, you turn that lever, that clutch, that clutch lever down to manual. And so one of the things, that the, uh, the gear and the flaps are electric. So it's not hydraulic. The only hydraulic uh, uh, units on this is the brakes, the brake system. 
here's another picture of that. That's the gear extension. I, and I always like this. And it's, it, again, it's kind of goes back to the simplicity of the, uh, of the design and the, and the, basically what they had and the mechanics of back of what they had, but it's basically looks like a ratchet or it is a ratchet. Uh, to, what's that, Ray? It operates just like a ratchet. It sure does. You can even see the the little uh, notch there, the little tab there that changes the direction. So uh, that is the uh, emergency gear extension. So you 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 actually crank that down or ratchet it down the the uh, gear if the uh, if the electrics fail. This is just another. Uh, interesting piece that I, I didn't know until you know studying about the P39 and looking into it. But uh, a lot of the uh, our fighter pilots uh, ended up flying the P39 as their first fighter. This was one of their first fighters to fly. But in this case, like Bud Anderson, this was over in California. And I thought this was a great picture. Uh, there's there's a young Triple A's Bud Anderson with his his uh, 1939 Ford convertible parked in the back and he's smiling and with his parachute over his shoulder, but here's a P-39 with Old Crow on it. So uh, I didn't realize that he had actually named a, an Old Crow before his P-51B model, but this was, his first fighter was a P-39, but it was in California. <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit about the specifics of uh, your airplane, Miss Connie, the, uh, the P-39. Uh, we've got a Kind of a historic photo, and and uh, one looks looks uh, in a little sad <laughs> for an airplane of its uh, of its quality to uh, sort of be uh, be here. I, I understand in a schoolyard. Yeah, the plane was being uh, ferried out to New Mexico, uh, actually to Arizona, I guess, where it was going to be scrapped in the early fifties and developed engine trouble. And I've heard both he landed in the city street and on a uh, small crop dusting strip, but he managed to get the plane down and the Air Corps didn't want to spend the money to uh, go out and fix it, to fly it over and scrap it. So it ended up in a schoolyard, kind of like on a post almost, and the kids, uh, it's almost miraculous to me that this much of the plane survived after a few years in the schoolyard with kids. But... Uh, the story is the CAF member was driving by and spotted it. A gentleman talked the principal out of it, and uh, it went through a couple of different uh, areas for restoration. John may have some more info on that. Well, I was, I'm was i just sitting there. I love this picture because um, I always think about the story of it being, a you know, it, I think it was supposed to be more of a, a display piece because I think it was an older school or whatever, you know, like a, like a junior high or high school that we're sitting in front of here. But. But you could imagine kids playing on this thing. Look, the door's even off of it. So they were crawling in it. And and I think the same thing, like Ray said, it's, it, it, it might have survived all the training that it was used back down in Harlingen as gunnery target training and, and things like that before it was uh, on its on its last last uh, trip. But the uh, how would you like to have had that in your schoolyard? Man, that would have... <laughs> look, at, look at how many kids would have been encouraged to go fly, and it probably did. I mean, wouldn't you love to know how many uh, how many future pilots and 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 people that you know fell in love with these aircraft because they got to grow up with a P thirty nine in their schoolyard? How long has the uh, Central Texas Wing been uh, stewards of the of the airplane? Uh, since the early seventies. Uh, I'm not sure of the dates, the exact dates, but uh, John Stokes, uh, the yeah. founder of the Central Texas Wing, got a hold of it and brought it to us uh, after a very extensive restoration. Uh, it made its first air show appearance at Randolph Air Force Base uh, in 1974. Uh, I forget yeah. the exact date of that. Yeah, that's that. Yeah, and that's right. Uh, that's basically when we received the aircraft, and in in our founder of uh, the Syntex Wing, John Stokes, who donated quite a bit of our aircraft and was the big big uh, uh, person sponsor of, of of the wing and the got us going. Um, this was one of the planes that that started us. So we've had this aircraft. Uh, we've been the caretakers uh, of the uh, only P thirty nine the CAF has owned. Uh, 
here at Syntex. So very proud of it. I, this is a, this is just inside of our hangar. This is just uh, actually just a couple of months ago. You can see some actual reenactors there that were there with uh, that's all brother our C forty seven. But that's where Miss Connie and the and the P thirty nine rests in our in our hangar uh, there at San Marcos uh, Airport. The Syntex wing. There's there you go. The picture uh, overhead. This was a picture I took. Um, right before our uh, dinner dance for uh, Veterans Day uh, dinner dance. And so we had all of our seven uh, uh, aircraft that we we uh, maintain and fly and Ray meticulously takes care of. And you can see the P-39 there uh, off off in the, uh, so there it is, yep. And that's that's actually kind of a neat picture too. Uh, you know, it's sitting next to a C-47 and a, and a B-25, but Look at the scale of it, because they're sitting next to a BT-13, and I and I, that's one of the things I think too. Every time I see the P-39, even compared to a P-63, the King Cobra, the P-39 is a small airplane. It's it's sleek. Uh, that's one of the advantages of having that engine uh, in the back. It's it's got a very uh, small profile uh, in the nose, but that's a that's a good comparison there. Sitting next to a BT-13 and our T6 and you can uh, you can tell the size of it but that's our that's our syntax hangar uh, in San Marcos um, it's actually a World War II hangar we're real real proud of our hangar it's a beautiful wood structure um, it's got a great museum lots of uh, priceless artifacts uh, in our museum and our briefing areas and our, our our different rooms that we've had built out and restored and just a real, real honor and privilege to be able to to be a part of this group. Ray, that's a paint scheme from earlier, isn't it? That's one of them. Yes, I think that's after they took it out of Russian colors. Uh, they left the nose cone, uh, the spinner, red, kind of as a tip of the hat to the Russian crew. Uh, it's gone through several paint schemes. Uh, we try to. I use it when we can to uh, draw a different crowd or draw some different attention to it. And uh, there we are in uh, Lieutenant Fiedler's colors. Uh, he was the only ace of the P-39. Uh, right now, we believe we're going to go back to that in the near future. It's a beautiful plane, though. Yeah, there it is, an arsenal of democracy. Uh, Craig Hutain flew it up there. Uh, what did we decide? Those what was that back in September of 2020? Seems how time flies, um, so to speak. Yeah. And uh, but Craig Craig flew it up there, no problems. Ray got it running running great, and um, Craig said it just really did perform well there and back to uh, San Marcos, so all the way up to DC and and back, and made good made good time with it. It's, it's, he, uh, it's a, he was. It's a, uh, he was trying to get home as he went through the went over the swamps of Louisiana, and he he pushed some speed limits, I think. But uh, uh, the plane held up well. We did uh, thirteen and a half hours uh, there and back, and trouble free, not a single squawk. Some good maintenance uh, taking care of that airplane. Great, great uh, good job, and the teams teams back yep. at the at the wing do a real good job. Well, good, and we're going to touch on uh, you know a couple of the things that that sort of were um, problem areas for the p39 we already talked about the uh, the electrical system uh, as being you know maybe a, a little bit of a weakness but also the uh, the radiator uh, was uh, one of the trouble spots as well and this is a radiator that uh, you actually replaced several years ago on on the airplane yes the uh, the plane if you read journals from back in the day it had three major faults uh the fuel system leaked horribly uh they did the best they could with the design and it was very poor at best the radiator technology in the mid-30s just wasn't up to uh doing a, a very efficient job of cooling a, a 1700 cubic, uh, cubic inch engine and uh, so it tended to overheat on the ground. Once you got up in the air and got the airflow going, you were okay. Uh, part of the, uh, the biggest part of the problem, honestly, is 
probably the air intakes, which are on the leading edge of the wing. Uh, we'll see those in another photograph, probably uh, two small ports, and they're just not large enough to push enough air through there to to cool it well. And well, it's yeah, cool, it, cool, it, cool it well, especially on the ground. Yeah, I mean it's once up in the air, they can adjust, and it's plenty of you know yeah. plenty of cooling once you're going, but on the ground you've got to, as soon as you start it as as ray and all of us have talked about and you'll see our pilots the as soon as you start it you're you're uh you're going to the end of the runway and you're taking off you're doing basically as much pre-fly as you can before you start the engine and then you're doing the rest as you're literally almost doing the mag check as you're going going to the end so Okay, this photograph, if you look beyond the cockpit towards the nose, you can actually see our water tank that we have installed in place of the cannon, uh, which was gone years ago. Uh, that water, that's a 25 gallon water tank, and there is a little electric motor that pumps uh, water onto a, the spray bar onto the radiator so that when the pilots are heading out for their take off, whether it's an air show or just a long taxi, uh, engine starts to overheat a little bit, they can shoot jets of cool water on it and buy some time. Uh, once they're up in the air, like John said, uh, there's enough airflow through those ports and the radiator to cool it, and it does it very well. Well, one of the reasons that we're featuring the uh, airplane in the 12 planes of Christmas is because uh, you're looking at uh, trying to take on one of the other problem spots with the P-39, and that is the original brake system. So uh, tell us a little bit about about that and, and uh, your fundraising and maintenance efforts uh, so far. Well, the original brake system, uh, pictured here, which you can't tell much, uh, the wheels are magnesium, uh, brittle but very light. And we've had a lot of problem with the wheels over the years cracking. Uh, I've been very fortunate to find exotic metal, uh, metal welders to repair that. The brakes themselves, and this is an excellent picture, uh, are stacks of metal plates. Uh, some are fixed to the landing gear, and then some have the little metal tabs that you see here in this picture that go into the wheel itself. So you've got alternating plates rubbing against stationaries or rotors and stators. And, uh, there's the most bizarre little hydraulic seal inside of that hub that is completely irreplaceable nowadays. Uh, it's not an O-ring, it's a square seal with metal clips keeping its shape to it. Uh, this type of brake will work beautifully for a short period, and then as it starts to heat up, it starts to fade and work less and less efficiently. Uh, this airplane has a free castering nose wheel, so there's no steering other than using the brakes and the rudder. And this aircraft, again, if you look at the, some pictures uh, we'll probably have up here shortly, you'll see it's got a fairly small rudder on it. So you're really stuck using your brakes. And if you get those fading too quickly, you're in real trouble trying to stop the plane. We have found a gentleman who has produced a set of custom disc brakes for it that required new wheels, uh, new calipers, uh, everything new related to the brake system. And John has uh, spearheaded that. I've been looking for years to find this guy, this particular person. I finally found him and was just too busy to do anything about it. And I handed off the info to John and John ran with it. And you see in this picture, the results. Uh, we're finally gonna get to, now this is causing me a little headache too. The, these beautiful aluminum wheels weigh a lot more than the magnesium ones are coming off. And the, the gear retract motor, I'm going to have to go in and do some reworking on it so that it can lift the load. Uh, it, it right now just won't be able to pull those things all the way up. But that's a small price to pay to have the peace of mind of knowing we've got world-class brakes on it. Unfortunately, they're very expensive, and that's what brings us here. So if uh, folks want to uh, help out the airplane uh, and uh, make uh, financial contributions, how can they go, go about doing that? 
Well, we're fortunate to be a part of this year's uh, 12 planes of Christmas. And so the P-39, so if you go up on this, uh, on the website for the, the CAF, the Commemorative Air Force, you'll see the, uh, the, the opportunity to donate to the P-39 and to be able to help us to raise this money for these uh, breaks. We're, we're real fortunate we've had a good start uh, early on when we decided that we wanted to do this. We were able to show the rarity of this aircraft and how, how important this is for, it's really a safety feature, obviously. I mean, it's a, these breaks will be something that I know Ray's been working on since he's been working on the P-39. Again, this is one of those issues that, and it's not just our P-39, this is an issue that they had even back in the, back in World War II with this particular setup. So uh, it's a, you know, again, it's something that, once we get this part done for the uh, the P-39, this will help us, you know, maintain this aircraft for easily another 50 years. Well, that's great. And we're looking forward to uh, seeing it continue to fly uh, for the next 50 years and even beyond that. Uh, as you mentioned, the uh, Commemorative Air Force website, or you can go directly to the, uh, the 12 Planes of uh, Christmas uh, fundraising site, which is supportcaf.org. That's supportcaf.org. You can find out more about the, the P-39 and the other aircraft that are all uh, featured in the uh, 12 planes of Christmas. What are some of the uh, other things that you have uh, planned in the in the future for the, uh, for the airplane? I know, uh, Ray, you had mentioned uh, possibly changing out the paint scheme. We've uh, been looking at that. We will be really like to get it back to feeler. Uh, there's all sorts of possibilities, but the paint on the plane is dated also. It's It's been on there. It got a slight respray seven or eight years ago, but uh, we would like to take the fabric off of the control surfaces, uh, examine all of those frames that are in there, put that back and then get the plane repainted. Uh, and then we can, the markings are pretty easy to, to change in and out. In this photograph you're seeing right now, the red nose and the tip of the red tail were, like I said, uh, just kind of a tip of the hat to the previous cruise, the Russian cruise. They had uh, markings like that on it. We decided to leave it at to honor them. That will probably go away and become green. Uh, uh, One of the other cosmetic the, things that we looked at doing was the uh, uh, cleaning up the interior of it uh, just so yeah because again we've owned the airplane and it's gone through so many hands of pilots and mechanics and over the years since the 70s and quite frankly it looks very similar to most warbirds but uh, with this particular one being so rare we're gonna we're gonna spend some more time on the on the uh, instrument panel and doing some of the little detailing work which which is great for our volunteers and and others to uh, to be able to to help help do so, just little little things like that, just to continue to keep it, and especially as we start to show it more and more uh, here in the air shows, you know, for people to come enjoy and see it, see the plane, and now like now they see it static, but obviously to go see it see it perform. Um, one of the neat things that and very rare opportunities that the Commemorative Air Force gets to do is to fly a P thirty nine next to one of its P sixty threes, you know, and and that's one of those routines that gets done. And as a matter of fact, they did it. We had our P-39 uh, at the uh, Wings Over Houston. And so that that was uh, done there and was a great opportunity to show show the two comparisons of the two planes and, and really a rare, rare opportunity to see these two in formation. Indeed. And uh, the uh, Central Texas wing uh, is a, very, a fairly uh, large and, and robust wing, but you're always looking for additional uh, members and volunteers. If uh, someone would like more information about uh, joining the wing, how do they find out more about uh, the Centex wing and all of your activities? Well, we have a really good Facebook uh, uh, presence, but also to our, our website, uh, centraltexaswing.org. Centraltexaswing.org is our website. But yes, we love having visitors, and I, and I really is. It's one of those uh, uh, our hangar. It always when people come in and they come in to see the aircraft, or they just find out about it, they show up and they go, "Wow, what a great place!" You know, what we wish we knew about this. Uh, because when you when you show up, we've got our aircraft. We got that's all, brother. We've got a C forty five. I mean, all our airplanes are flying, and and just a 
and it, and then again in a very historic hangar itself, a World War II hangar there on Gary Field uh, back back in the day. So I um, uh, no, I just encourage people to look us up, and we would uh, welcome them. There's quite frankly, there's people there just about all the time. Uh, we have a hundred and roughly about 160 65 uh, members of our Central Texas Wing, so uh, good group, and uh, we're we're proud 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 to have everybody. All right. Well, before we wrap up tonight, uh, Ray, any any final thoughts on the uh, on the P39 or the, uh, the Central Texas uh, Wing? Uh, well, I, I, it's just such a blessing for me as a airplane freak and a mechanic to be able to go out and work on all these small birds. Uh, this P-39 is one of only three flying anywhere in the world. And uh, if you'd like to see those other two get together with us, uh, uh, we're going to work on that and get some 63s together too. But uh, I'll echo what John said. Uh, please look us up, come out. Talk to us, visit us, and uh, join us if you get a chance. And the CAF, uh, outstanding organization. Indeed. Again, um, you can support the uh, P-39 and any of the other 12 planes uh, featured aircraft. Just go to supportcaf.org, supportcaf.org. And uh, we uh, thank you both for uh, joining us on this Warbird Tube webinar. Uh, for those of you watching, if you have any suggestions on future uh, topics you'd like us to cover, people you'd like us to interview, or airplanes you'd like to see uh, and learn more about, just drop a quick note to Leah Block at uh, media at cafhq.org. John and Ray, have a great night, and again, thank you for joining us, and for those of you who are tuning in, thank you as well. I'm your host, Steve Buss, and this is another CAF Warbird Tube webinar. Good night. Good night.